going down for real. Hey, today I'm going to be talking about the foundation of chemistry. This is really why chemistry works the way it does. And it all comes down to cloud theory. Cloud theory is based on the quantum model of the atom, which states that that the subatomic particles like electrons are not exactly in a fixed position. Let me give you an example. Here you see this dot, right? It's really well defined, okay? But it's really small. So this you can imagine as an electron if we have a weak microscope. Then we have a better microscope. We zoom in further on it. So you'd expect that it would stay the same clarity or even become more clear. But unfortunately, it becomes more blurred. So even though we can see it more up close, the picture that we see is more blurred. This is what would happen if you zoomed in on an image as well. And then let's say we took an even more powerful microscope and we zoomed in even further. Well, now the electron is pretty big, but it's so blurry. You can't exactly tell where the electron is. And this is basically what happens to most really tiny pieces of matter. If you zoom into them enough, you can't exactly tell where they are. And electrons are like that too. They're both waves and particles at the same time. So they could be in one place and they could be in another. This is because of something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Basically, knowing the energy of an electron is really important for figuring out stuff in chemistry. So we try and calculate the energy of an electron really precisely. But what happens because of that is we can't calculate the, ener the position of that electron accurately. And so if we want to calculate the energy accurately, we have to give up knowing the position of the electron accurately. And that's why electrons, we say, they don't exist in a specific place, like in classical physics, but they kind of exist in a cloud. So for example, if you look at this, right? This shape that I've drawn here, where is the electron? Well, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be anywhere. It's more likely, however, to be in here, where it's darker, than over here, where it's white. If we imagine the electron as a tiny black dot, right? But it could be here. There's a low probability, but it could be. Basically, all of chemistry is fundamentally based in this theory that electrons can be in any position, but we can figure out the probability of where they're likely to be most of the time. 90% of the time, the electron is somewhere in this region. Here you have a planet and you have clouds around it in space. Now, this kind of model is very useful to understanding atoms. In atoms, there's a small nucleus represented by the planet, right? Uh, it's very highly positively charged. And then there's clouds around it the clouds which are electrons. So this is an electron cloud. And so there's clouds of electrons around that nuclear planet, <laughs> nuclear planet. And each electron has a specific combination of four quantum numbers. It's kind of like its own fingerprint. Each one has a unique set of four values, right? N, L, ML, and MS. N can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, any number like that. This is called the principal energy level. So it goes from 1 to 7. The L. The L is called the angular momentum quantum number. Basically, this is my personal favorite uh, quantum number because it's the most interesting. L determines the shape of the orbital. Remember, the orbital is the shape of the cloud. Okay, so this cloud has an oval or egg shape, right? The value of L that the electron has tells you the shape of the cloud, the shape of the area where it's most likely to be, where it's likely to be 90% of the time, okay? So L can take on four values so far. We have only discovered four values for L. When L is equal to zero, then the electron takes up a sphere orbital, a spherical orbital. When L equals to one, it takes up this weird dumbbell-shaped orbital. So when it's a spherical orbital, we call it an S orbital. When it's a dumbbell-shaped orbital, we call it a P orbital, because dumbbell starts with P, of course. 
uh, when it's uh, this weird shape with like the dumbbell but also a donut in the middle that's called that's when L is equal to 2 and that's called a d orbital and then when L is equal to 3 which is the maximum we've been able to find in nature and by experiments um, then it's in this f orbital where it's like the dumbbell but it's broken apart by two donut rings right so l is a property of the uh, electron it can take four values 0 1 2 or 3 right and based on these values we can determine the shape of the cloud the shape which the electron cloud takes around the nucleus okay now ml this is called the magnetic quantum number hence the m okay but this one is also called an m but has nothing to do with magnetism just it's weird and the l helps you remember the fact that it's related to the dumbbell shape so when you have a sphere you can only arrange it in one way that's just like this straight around the um the planet but when you have a dumbbell you can have a dumbbell like this you can have a dumbbell like this you let me show you you can have a dumbbell that is shaped like you can have a dumbbell shaped like this you can have a dumbbell shaped like this and you can have a dumbbell shaped like this remember this third one it's in 3d so you have to imagine 3d so you can have in the x-axis the y-axis or the z-axis and hence you can have three orientations this one you can have five orientations this one you can have seven orientations so we say that the uh, maximum number it's the next odd number so this can have one orientation this can have three this can have five this can have seven okay uh, so you could also say it's all the integers from minus L to positive L um, it's basically the same as saying each time you increase L by one you add two more possibilities for arrangement in space right so and then you have ms which is the spin quantum number now this one i like to think of kind of like gender right so there's two possible spins that electrons are in most of the time so you can think of those like male and female pink and blue if you would so the male and female spins now there's other kinds of spins that electrons can take like the charm quantum number the charm spin or the strange spin but those are kind of like, you know, the weird attack helicopter genders and all those things. We tend to ignore them because they're so rare. So most of the time, uh, the spin quantum number is either spin up or spin down. Now spin doesn't actually mean it's spinning, but it's just a property that it has. It's weird. I can't really describe it to you except with an analogy of gender. So you have pink clouds and you have blue clouds. Now the thing is, Pink and blue clouds don't repel each other as much as blue and blue clouds. So the atom, the electrons are really into no homo. So pink and pink don't stay together. Blue and blue don't stay together. But blue and pink can stay together. So let's say you have this region around the nucleus, right? And this region can have two different clouds in it. But only, but because... Uh, all of these other numbers would be the same, right? It's in the same energy level, so it's just as far away from the nucleus. It has the same L value, which means it's in the same shape, the spherical shape. It has the same ML value because uh, the sphere is aligned in the same way. But in order for two of them to share this, they have to have a different uh, value for MS. Otherwise, they would have the same value for all four, and they have to be special snowflakes. They have to be unique each one has to have a separate uh, value separate combination of these four values so this one has to be different so if one is spin up it, the other has to be spin down otherwise it won't be able to fit into this area so again thinking of it in terms of gender and no homo of course 
um, you can't have a male and a male or a female and a female. You can only have a male and a female in this occupying the same region, right? So you can only have a spin up and a spin down in the same place. So these four quantum numbers help decide the main properties of atoms, uh, of electrons in atoms. And because we know the number of electrons in atoms, we can use that to decide how they will behave chemically. So if you know NL, ML, and MS, then you'll be able to figure out what the properties of that electron is, are. And N is really helpful in determining the average distance of that electron from the nucleus and the average energy that it has. Now you might be thinking, wait, doesn't that contradict the fact that we don't know that I said at the beginning of the video, like I said, that we don't know exactly where it is. So how can we know the average distance? Well, even though we don't know exactly where it is, we can still figure out an average distance. So let's say you have this point, right? This is your electron cloud. Now you move it a little closer. So even though you don't know exactly where it is, and you don't, you didn't know exactly where it was, you can tell that earlier it was further and now it's closer. And so if you kind of average all the points across where it could be, so find some middle point, like I don't know, here, if you found some middle point like here, then you'd be able, so let's say this is the midpoint, right? And then this is another midpoint. So you move it from here to here, right? So then you can measure the distance from here to the nucleus and here to the nucleus. And then you figure out that the average distance has decreased. So in this way, we can figure out the energy and uh, the properties of electrons. And figuring out the properties of the electrons is the first step, the foundation of chemistry. Thank you for listening.